A very hot topic when it comes to the installation of lithium batteries on board sailboats lately has been the ability of their owners to insure their boats after upgrading their electrical systems to lithium batteries. And more generally, some owners still have safety concerns about lithium. It seems that the sailing industry hasn't fully caught up with new technologies, and as I mentioned in my latest video in which I bust some of the common myths about lithium batteries, this has gotten so bad that some insurance companies straight up refuse to insure boats or come up with unobtainable insurance requirements. With the advancement of battery technology, lithium has become an increasingly popular way to power onboard electrical systems, and finally the standards are catching up. The American Boating and Yachting Council, otherwise known as ABYC, finally came out with its long-awaited lithium battery standards this summer called ABYC E13. One of the many great things about it is that it provides insurance companies with a basis to insure boats equipped with lithium batteries. Now, if insurance companies finally open their minds, that's another story. We'll see how things progress, but for now, let's have a look at what the ABYC E13 standard says about what makes for a safe lithium battery system on board a sailboat. If this is your first time on this channel, hi, my name is Ryan, and together with my partner Sophie, we have been sailing the world since 2018 on board our sailboat, Polar Seal, navigating about 25,000 miles between Sweden, the Mediterranean, across the Atlantic three times, and now the US East Coast. I also happen to be one of the founders of a popular lithium battery company called Dakota Lithium, which has been catering to the sailing world since 2018 and is currently powering thousands of sailboats, including ours. And now a bit of a disclaimer. I am 100% partial to the batteries that we produce because over the years we have put so much effort and resources into making them the most cost and energy efficient possible. And we are very passionate about what we produce. But this video is not an ad for my company. I just happen to be very nerdy about the world of lithium batteries. And as I have learned, some of you are too. There are dozens of us. And quick update, since I filmed this video, I have gone through the ABYC Marine Electrical Technicians course uh, with ABYC and passed. What this does is it gives you a stamp of approval saying that you know and understand the ABYC standards and how to safely install marine electrical systems on board boats. So yeah, according to ABYC, I'm a marine electrical technician. First, what are standards and why does it matter to us? In the pleasure boat industry, there are a number of standards organizations which put some of the brightest minds together to develop manufacturing and installation standards for boat builders and maintainers around the world. In reality, boat building is still very much like sailing the open ocean. With very few exceptions, there are very few regulations or certification that go into pleasure craft boat building. Unlike aircraft manufacturing, where every nut, bolt, screw is serial numbered and certified. In the United States, the US Coast Guard is chartered with ensuring seagoing craft are safe. However, much of their regulation is focused on safety equipment or standards for smaller personal watercraft with gas engines. For pleasure boats, like sailboats, it's the American Boating and Yachting Council that sets boat building standards. So everything from how an engine should be installed, how to protect your boat from corrosion, to how to install batteries on a boat. You see where I'm going with that. Technically, the standards set by ABYC are not mandatory. Like, there's no ABYC inspectors going around a dock to carry out inspections. But insurance companies really like boats that are built according to ABYC standards. So that's for the US. In Europe, things are a bit different, and the European Union member states have adopted the Recreational Boating Directive. These directives are made up of specific guidelines developed by the International Organization for Standards, which you know as ISO. When a boat manufacturer follows those ISO directives, their boats get a CE certification. And as opposed to the US, all commercial boat manufacturers are required to obtain that CE certification before they can put their boats on the market. Australia and New Zealand have a happy mix of the two systems. Most of their rules are borrowed from ABYC, but as opposed to the United States, those rules are mandatory, just like in the EU. For the sake of this video, I'm only going to reference ABYC standards, which is called E13 lithium ion batteries. As we are filming this, it's November 2022, and it's my understanding that the ISO standards for lithium batteries, otherwise known as ISO TS 23625, is in the review stage. Before we go into the nerdy details of ABYC E13 standard, go and watch our latest video about what you should know before installing lithium batteries. In this video, we cover concepts such as battery chemistry, thermal runaway, BMS, or dump loads. If you aren't familiar with those terms, this video may be a bit confusing. A quick note before we start. 
In order to consult the full set of standards, you'll have to actually buy a copy or become a member of ABYC. Creating and selling those standards is how those organizations exist. They hire experts and do a lot of work to establish and publish these guidelines. And just like everyone else, they don't work for free. It's a bit of a pity for us private persons who are interested in the guidelines, but the pricing isn't outrageous, so I bought a copy. If you wanna buy yours, you can do so at the link in the description below. And no, we are not sponsored by ABYC or ISO. Also, a technical nerdy note for those not used to reading technical regulation documentation. There are two words that have significant meaning that should be pointed out. The word shall means the builder or installer needs to follow that section in order to be in compliance with the standard or directive. And the word should is more voluntary in meaning. When you read the standards, you will also find some technical notes under the standards to provide background, context, and recommendations. Okay, let's talk about chemistry. One very interesting fact about the ABYC standards, the absence of recommendations about the type of lithium battery chemistry that should or shouldn't be installed on a sailboat. Just a reminder, lithium batteries can be made of a few different materials. When you hear the term lithium ion, this can be whatever type of lithium batteries, but there are actually a few different materials that each have different properties and applications and advantages and disadvantages. So for example, you will find lithium cobalt oxide in smartphones, laptops, cameras, but in electric cars, you will find lithium nickel manganese cobalt batteries. On boats, we mostly use lithium iron phosphate. The reason why this particular type of battery is used on boats, and for the full refresher, go check out our lithium batteries myth-busting video above. Okay, so the standard does not mention chemistry, which is interesting, but its appendix explains the thermal runaway phenomenon. Thermal runaway is what happens when a cell's batteries get damaged, which results in rapid heating of the cells. And in more simple terms, thermal runaway equals fire. As I mentioned in our myth busting video, thermal runaway occurs at different temperatures for different types of battery chemistry, with some entering thermal runaway at way lower temperatures than others. So it's interesting that ABYC doesn't take a stand for what lithium battery chemistry would be more appropriate on a boat and surprised me a bit. But the battery industry is evolving and developing so rapidly that I'm not massively shocked by this and it will be interesting to see how those standards evolve in the future. So now let's talk about the batteries themselves. While the ABYC doesn't mention chemistry, it does require that the batteries or the cells meet one of seven standards set out by the IEC, the International Electrotechnical Commission, or the SAE International, the Society of Automotive Engineers, or UL, Underwriters Laboratory. Essentially, someone else sets the standard for what a safe battery or cell is, but the E13 standard does state that the battery itself shall come with a handbook provided by the manufacturer, and that handbook shall contain a number of critical safety information, including chemistry, safety hazards, safety features, as well as charging and discharging recommendations. So for example, Dakota lithium cells are tested according to the IEC 62133 and are certified under UL 1642, both of which are appropriate standards according to ABYC. Now let's look at what ABYC says about lithium battery installation on boats. From a high level, the ABYC E13 technical standard looks at the installation and operation of lithium batteries from a system-wide perspective, as opposed to an individual battery perspective. This means that rather than setting a standard for the batteries or the cells themselves, which as we have established, someone else does, the standards focus on what makes for a safe lithium battery system. It's also worth noting that there is another standard in case of the installation of batteries that will be specifically used for the propulsion of a boat. Right now, we are only talking about the installation of house banks. In general, ABYC requirements essentially say that all batteries need to be installed correctly in compliance with a number of their other standards. For example, the ABYC states that the lithium batteries shall be installed in accordance with ABYC E11, which covers how AC and DC electrical systems on boats need to be installed. E13 also states that lithium ion battery systems shall be installed, commissioned, and maintained in accordance with manufacturer's recommendations. So what's important here is to make sure that the manufacturer provides those recommendations. Those can concern fusing, wiring, charge profiles, maximum current output, minimum charging temperatures, etc. The next point that the ABYC E13 standard covers is the installation of a BMS, or a battery management system. It states that all lithium batteries shall have a BMS installed. The installation of these BMS may be internal or external to the battery, and that's fine. 
What is important here is that the BMS must be able to cut off charging and discharging current to the battery if a high voltage event occurs, a low voltage event occurs, or if the battery reaches too high of a temperature or too low of a temperature. What constitutes high voltage, low voltage, high temperature, or low temperature is all set by the manufacturer. So again, manufacturer recommendations are key. In our latest video on the topic, we look at the ability for the BMS to communicate with each other, enabling the battery system to balance the cells. It is interesting to note that ABYC does not suggest or require that the BMS should have the ability to communicate with other equipment, but it doesn't surprise me. The important piece of the puzzle here is the ability of the BMS to shut off the battery to keep the cells safe and for the system to alert the user if a BMS shutdown is near. In the notes section, however, the ABYC recommends the following, that an alternative power source that powers critical systems be added to the system in the event that the BMS cuts off charging and discharging and is not able to reset itself. This means that there should be a backup battery installed on the boat, but not part of the main house bank, charged and ready to use in case the BMS shuts down the batteries. I personally think this is a wise recommendation. After giving it a few thoughts, Sophie and I will be adding a critical loads battery on board Polar Seal in the spring. So stay tuned for that. The note section also states that the battery system should notify the operator with a visual or audible alarm before disconnecting the battery from the DC system. Nowhere does it say that the BMS itself needs to be connected to any charging sources, nor that the BMS itself needs to be capable of providing that warning. The key here is it's the entire system that needs to work together to provide the alarm, but then again, it's a recommendation, not a requirement. On Polar Steel, we meet this recommendation by setting our battery monitor to warn us of conditions approaching BMS cutoff so we can act and shut down the system or troubleshoot prior to anything going on. I personally feel that the system-wide approach makes for a more sensible recommendations. In the practice of risk management, the system-wide approach is the preferred route because accidents are rarely caused by one single event. They are usually the consequence of multiple points of failure and is therefore good practice to look at a system rather than a single part of it. Now let's go back to the installation of the batteries. The ABYC E13 standard states that the batteries shall be installed in areas where ambient temperatures are in accordance with the manufacturer's recommendations. So a general piece of advice here would probably be not to put your house bank inside your engine compartment. The E13 standard states that the batteries shall be attached to a battery switch, which provides a means of disconnecting the battery independent of the BMS, that your battery shall be protected from seawater spray and water ingress, and that they should be restrained and tied down in a location that protects them and limits shock, vibration, and movement. So why do those standards matter to you? And is it important for you to apply those standards to your boat? So far, it's a little early to assess how having those standards will impact us. I liked reading them. I took away a few lessons, such as the need for redundancy, but I'll probably not have E13 in hand when I do the next install. I think that short term, having a set of standards allows for insurance companies to assess if an installation is safe and meets acceptable risk levels, which would be a game changer for US boat owners. Also remember when I said there weren't a lot of good electricians capable of installing lithium batteries on sailboats? Well, with an official set of guidelines, we may see a change as well. And finally, I could see how surveyors would also be better equipped to assess a lithium battery system when it is time for you to buy a boat. But the ABYC standards are constantly being reviewed and the E13 is only the first take on lithium batteries on a boat. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. And if you like our channel, please consider subscribing. We have a lot of really fun things going on right now. Our course about how to sail the world has just launched. If you're interested in it, please check out our website, ryanandsophie.com. We also have a lot of other fun things. Got my t-shirt lines out. We've got a book coming. Sophie's still working on her cookbook. There's so much, so many things coming. So thank you for watching. If you have any comments or questions, please leave them in the comment section below. And until next time, bye-bye. My, my cookbook has been in the work for the last three years, Ryan. Don't create That's why I keep saying, keep oh saying. Oh my God, that's embarrassing.